3.16 conductors and the second uniqueness theorem. So we've already seen the first uniqueness theorem, uh, which proved that it, as long as you specify the potential along the boundaries of a region, then you know that there, if there is a solution for the potential inside that satisfies the boundary conditions, then that must be the solution. This one's a little bit different. Um, what if we don't know um, the potential at the boundary of a region, right? So let me let me kind of draw that. Oh, I'll use a different color. I'll make it big this time. I always make small pictures. This time it'll be big. So we have some random region, right? Now we could extend this random region out to infinity, uh, and if as long as we're not dealing with one of those weird textbook problems with infinite charges, um, the potential at infinity should be zero, or at least some constant, right? And uh, I like his little comment that um, we call that ground, or experimentalists call it ground. Uh, that just means that V equals zero. So ground is where the, v, the potential is zero. For um, So next time you talk to your electric um, engineer friend or you know some experimental physicist that uh, kind of forgot these theorems. If he says ground is substituting, you had V equals zero. So you have some boundary to this problem. Um, and But we're going to make it a little more difficult. If if we're given um, uh, conducting... Uh, different. So we're given like, you know, blobs of conductors of some shape, right? And we don't know how the charge is arranged on these conductors. We just know that they have a certain charge. So like this one maybe has plus Q1, and this one has plus Q2, and this one has plus Q3, right? They have some charge on the surface. Maybe no charge, maybe some charge. Uh, but we don't know how the, the sigma on the surface is going to allocate that charge. It's just something that we're not going to be able to calculate at this time. Uh, to make things harder, let's say that in between we have some uh, charge density in this, this region around here, right? So um, can we have multiple solutions to this or is there only one solution to problems like this? And uh, uniqueness theorem number two um, tells us, so uniqueness number, says that there is a one unique solution given this kind of problem. Um, and it kind of says like this. So in a region uh, containing conductors, and filled with a specified charge density rho, rho, uh, the electric field is uniquely determined, is uniquely, and I spelled that with a G, so I'll make it look like a Q, uniquely determined by, if the total charge, by the uh, total charge on each conductor, um, mm -hmm. And that's pretty much all you need to know. So, um, and we can we can take the region as a whole and bind it with a conductor, or put it, put it all inside of a conductor, or we can have it go off to infinity. Um, so here's the proof, and this is a, a rather involved proof, and you kind of won't see where I'm going until I've gone there. Um, so let's start walking through the proof. So here's the proof. It's always fun to do physics proofs. Um, so. Let's say we have two electric fields. We have E vector one and E vector two, and these all satisfy the boundary conditions. Okay. And both obey Gauss's law in differential form with between the, the between the um, between the conductors. So that says uh, the divergence is equal to rho over epsilon naught. And this one also U2 also has the same divergence between the conductors. And so this is between. And uh, we also have the integral form of Gauss's law, which says the surface integral of, uh, this is over the ith surface. 
is equal to one over uh, epsilon naught times the total charge on that conductor. And that's true for both of them, so let's write that out. Equals uh, one over epsilon naught QI uh, for all the different conductors. And outside, um, so it's equal, hold on a second, and outside, um, oh, the outside surface. So the outside surface, we also have um, Gauss's law in integral form state that um, the total charge of everything, including the rows um, and all the conductors, uh, one over epsilon naught Q, this is the outside. Okay. So um, so let's look at, we're gonna invent this E3 field just like we've done for the potentials. And this is going to equal the difference between the two fields. And if they turn out to be the same, we're gonna find that E3 is equal to zero. So we have, let's try um, the divergence of E3. Well, that's just equal to the divergence of E1 minus the divergence of E2. And since they're both equal, so this is rho over epsilon naught, and this is rho over epsilon naught, and we're subtracting, then the divergence of E3 is zero. So the divergence of E3, that's gonna be important. Um, we can also find that for any surface, the, let me get another piece of paper here going. For any surface, we have um, the surface integral of E3 dot dA vector is equal to, well, that's the integral of E1 vector minus E2 vector dot dA vector. And well, that's equal to two integrals minus the integral of E2 vector dot dA. Well, these are always gonna be equal. So you have the same charge canceling each other out. So this is equal to zero as well. So the surface integral is always equal to zero as well, okay? And um, also, for each of the conductors, we know that the potential is gonna be constant. Um, so E3 vector is going to be equal to minus the divergence of the potential. So, um, um, so V3 is constant for each of the conductors. Um, let, me, let me double check something really quick on this proof, right? I'm having second thoughts. So, um, yeah, so V3 is a constant, not necessarily the same constant over each of the connecting surfaces, right? Um, now, because E1 and E2 might be different, then the potential that E1 gives and the potential that E2 gives could be different. Uh, on the different conducting, on the same conducting surfaces. So the next part is we're gonna take, this is the trick, this is kind of the core, the pivot point of this, this theorem. So we take product rule number five. Um, look on the inside of your book cover. This states that um, the divergence of a scalar field times a um, vector field is going to be equal to that scalar field times the divergence of that vector field uh, plus the vector field dotted with the gradient of that scalar field. Okay, now I've just showed you earlier that the divergence of E3 is equal to zero everywhere. So that's zero, okay? And the divergence of, of I'm sorry, the gradient of the potential is just E3, okay? So we basically get this is equal to E3 squared, okay? The next step is we're going to do an integral of over the, the volume between um, the conductors of the divergence of V3 E3 uh, d tau. Okay. Well, that's going to equal, thanks to Gauss's theorem, that's going to equal 
the surface integral of V3 E3 vector dot dA. Okay, and that's the surfaces of each of the conductors and the surface on the outside. Okay, so then we have that has to be equal to, well, we just did um, this, and we substitute V3, E3 is equal to E3, so that's going to be equal to um, E3, I'm sorry, E3 squared d tau. Okay, so this integral is E3 squared d tau because this, we just calculated it up here, is equal to E3 squared. And let's just write that over here so we don't lose it. Okay. So what's interesting is that we can now note that for each of the surfaces, the potential is constant, right? So the surface integral, the surface integral over here, we can pull out that V3. Okay? Um, and we've also calculated earlier that the integral e3 dot dA is equal to zero. So this is equal to zero. Okay? So we've just proved that this integral e3 squared d tau is equal to zero. Well, you can have an integral equal to zero if, if some places it's positive and some places it's negative in equal amounts. But since this is the square of a vector, it's always going to be positive. And so it has to be always uh, greater than or equal to zero. And so we're left to conclude that E3 must be equal to zero as well. Everywhere. Okay. And since E3 equals to zero, well then E3, zero is equal to E1 minus E2. And so E2 vector is equal to E1 vector. And um, so there's a couple points here that um, that this whole argument has a clutch on, right? Um, one is that we found the divergence of E3 is zero, okay? And that's just by distributing it between E1 and E2. The other is that we found the surface integral of E3 of any of the Gaussian surfaces that we're using is going to be zero, right? And the last is this, this little bit right here where we said, well, E3 is the, is the divergence, I'm sorry, the gradient of the potential. So that potential must be constant on those surfaces, right? And so when we did this surface integral here, we knew that on those surfaces, V3 was constant. And so now we have a constant times this integral, which is up here, which we know is zero. And then we know that E3 now is zero. So it's, it's not an elegant proof and um, it's not quite uh, intuitive, but it is powerful, okay? And we're gonna use Purcell's example so he says, suppose you have a charge configuration like this. You have four conductors. These are all con like conducting little tiny balls, right? And then you have like some electric field that sets up, right? And then suppose that um, we take a conductor and connect these two guys to each other like this. Okay, and the question is, do those charges stay there or do they move, right? And your first thought might be like, well, these charges attract each other, so they're probably gonna stay there, right? But for this problem right here, what you're basically saying is there's a total charge on this one, and there's a total charge on this one, and there's no charges in between, okay? And we can use boundary conditions of the entire universe um, for the outside surface. And so this is no different than this, okay? where there's no charge here, okay? There's zero charge there. And the reason why we can say that the charges are gonna go this way is not because of you know some force analysis of how each of the charges move, but because of the, unique, the second uniqueness theorem that says the electric field, um, for uh, given the same boundary conditions of the total charge on the conductors and the charges in between and the edge conditions, the electric field that satisfies those conditions is the only solution for that, that theorem. So for that problem. And so the only solution for this problem is a solution where you have no charge on the, the metal spheres. So anyway, it, it took this complicated problem that you probably would have spent, you know, your entire undergrad career um, figuring it out and it turned it into a very, very simple solution. Thanks for your time. Bye.